Why can't we all just get along? Whether it's sibling rivalry, problems in your marriage, arguments with the boss at work, and in all areas of our life, we have a, a yearning and desire to experience oneness with the people around us. And yet it's so difficult. It's so challenging. Why is that? Well, stick around with me for a little bit, and we're going to open up what the Bible has to say about experiencing unity in diversity. Hi, I'm Pastor Willie Vaughn, and I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in with me and watch or listen as we unpack together biblical wisdom for life. Unity. Unity in diversity. It's a, a basic Christian doctrine. It's a core value of God. And God desires us to experience unity and oneness with the people around us in a balanced way. God wants you to be successful. In, in 1 John, sorry, 3 John 1, 2 says, I pray that you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. God wants you to experience success. He wants you to experience the right kind of success. There's been lots of people who have experienced success in business, financial success, only to have their relationships totally fall apart and end up being lonely and alone. But the kind of success God desires for you is to be rich in every area of your life, to be rich in your relationships, to be rich in success, to be rich in your health, and to be rich in your heart and your soul and your spirit. And that's why this concept of unity, unity is so important to God. Unity in diversity. So let's look together at what God's Word has to say about this subject. Our base scripture for today is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 through 16. And Paul writes, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended down to the lower earthly regions? Jesus came down to earth to be with us as our Emmanuel. And he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. For after giving his life on the cross for our sins, it says he ascended, the Bible tells us, Jesus ascended back into heaven to prepare a place for us. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And for this reason, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. When we attain that, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching or by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Everybody's got a story. Everybody's got an angle. Everybody's got an edge. But if we grow into maturity the way God wants us to, in a unified way, we won't be blown around. We won't be caught off guard by that, those stories, those lies, those schemes. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work.
God desires balance. And often in the scriptures for his church uses this picture of a body being connected and assembled together. God desires us to be in unity in a balanced way. He calls us to make every effort to put in the effort because we know unity is not easy. All we have to do is look at the world around us and realize how difficult, how challenging unity is, whether it's in our politics, in our country, in our communities, maybe in our homes or in our job places. Unity is a challenge, yet we all desire to experience that oneness, and God wants us to experience it. And so he tells us, make every effort. Now we have to realize it's not always possible. It's just in some situations, you can't be at peace. You can't be at unity. Romans 12, 18 says, As much as is possible by you, be at peace with all people. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. But I love God. He is always particular about His wording. Not blessed are the peacekeepers but blessed are the peacemakers. Some people try to keep peace and just do whatever it is, compromise on every issue, as long as everybody around them, they just try to keep people happy. And Jesus doesn't tell us that. He says, be a peacemaker. Do what's right to make peace. And as much as is possible by us, but there are certain situations where others will not allow that. And also in 2 Corinthians, God tells us, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Because what fellowship can righteousness have with wickedness and what unity can darkness have with light? You understand there's certain things we need to stand up for. We can't just say, okay, I'll go along with everything. When something is totally against us, there is an enemy trying to destroy us, trying to destroy what we hold to be true. That's not where we bring unity in. But I think so much in our communities and in the world around us, There are people trying and just having different viewpoints and we become so divided instead of putting in the effort to be unified, to experience unity in the midst of diversity. But why is this important? There's three reasons unity is important. Before I even get into saying how we achieve this, we need to know why we want to try to make the effort. First and foremost, There is no way possible I am right 100% of the time. And I'm sure you all agree with that. But there's no way possible that you are right 100% of the time. Second, there is no way that I don't need you. There's no way that I don't need others. There's no way that you don't need other people in your life. And thirdly, life is just more beautiful in color. Wouldn't you agree? But there's no way. The first point, there's, there's no way that I'm always 100% right. Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. We all make mistakes. We all mess up. We all get things wrong sometimes. And Proverbs 27.17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so does one person, one man sharpen another. We sharpen each other. When I get things wrong, I need to be corrected. When you get things wrong, you won't grow, you won't learn unless there's someone around to correct you. I've seen so many people become isolated and get into this point of view where they think that everything they believe is 100% right. And they've never been challenged. If you never get challenged, if you never get corrected, you will never grow into your full potential. You'll get stuck in a rut and just always be the same, never growing, never becoming all that you can be. We grow through challenge. We grow through correction. Imagine a kindergartner never learning anything, never being told, no, one plus one does not equal three. We learn through correction. We need it because none of us are perfect. And 1 John 1, 8 says, if anyone thinks he's without sin, he's already deceived and the truth is not in him. There's no way any of us gets it right 100% of the time. And that's why unity is so important. Unity in diversity, it challenges us. In Galatians 6.1, it says, when you see someone who's caught in a sin, who's caught in a struggle, restore them gently. We need the kind of communities that will do that, will restore one another when we're wrong. 
and be able to elect people in our lives who will also restore us. There's no way that you or I are right 100% of the time. And that second point, there's no way we don't need each other. In Genesis 2.18, God said, It is not good, not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. Anyone who says in that arrogant, puffed up way, I don't need anybody, in that moment calls God a liar. We have this term, I used to love it hearing it, self-made man, a self-made person, but it's a total lie. Nobody gets to where they are without the help of others, without building upon a foundation someone else has laid, someone else has set down. Nobody gets to where they are without learning from other people, without having other people help them along the way. We all look back and can see in our lives where there are times that other people were there for us to lift us up when we fell down. And there is no way that we don't need one another. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, it talks about that. And Solomon, one of the wisest men to ever live, says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either one of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. If two lie down together, they will keep warm, but you can't keep warm alone. And though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. We need one another. There's no way we don't need one another. But also that third point of why unity is so important Psalm 133 says how beautiful it is when brothers and sisters live together in harmony. In harmony. I think of the barbershop quartet. Maybe that's a little old-fashioned. Maybe we'll bring it a little, a little more modern. How about the boy band? You know, the different voices that balance each other out. You see, life is better when we have that harmony, when we have that variety. They say variety is the spice of life. And if you're just around people who are exactly the same all the time, you lose out on how beautiful life can be. Whether it's a, a rainbow or a colorful fireworks show. How about a buffet with a whole bunch of different tastes and smells to enjoy? Variety is the spice of life. And life is more beautiful when we have to share with other people who are different. Life is more beautiful in color. I love the idea of variety. And sometimes we just need to change it up in our lives a little bit. I remember reading a, about a quote of an old cowboy on a cattle drive. And it was, after weeks of beans and taters, even a switch to taters and beans is welcome. We need some variety. We need some color. We need other people in our lives to bring it meaning and depth and color. There's no way you or I are right 100% of the time. We need unity. There's no way we don't need one another. And life is more beautiful in color. So now that we've talked about the importance of unity, how do we embrace it and how do we define it and grow in it? First, we have to understand how important it is because there is danger in division. Being divided is dangerous. It's not that unity is just a good thing. It's that a lack of unity is so dangerous and destructive. You've heard the phrase divide and conquer. That's what happens when division comes about, whether it's in a family, in a church, in an organization, or maybe even in a company. That's why companies sometimes have team building exercises and retreats because they understand the danger of division. Jesus told a story about that in Mark chapter 3 and said if a, in verse 24 through 27, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. The end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Division is so dangerous. You know about nuclear energy and nuclear bombs. They both start with the same principle, division. 
dividing the nucleus of an atom. It's called fission. And fission gives off so much destructive energy if it's not controlled. Think of an atom bomb just blowing up. How much destructive power is in that, in that division? That's the, how destructive division can be in our lives. When we're divided from one another, divided from the benefit of unity in our lives. Now, there are times when, when fission is good in a controlled way that separating can be a good thing. It can create energy and momentum and heat and a wonderful power. There are some times that organizations grow and, and have to multiply and divide and split up and cover more area. Churches can multiply and cover more ground and reach more people if it's done in a loving, caring, controlled way. But when there's that fission that's just a destructive division, it is so destructive. It tears down instead of building up. Division is dangerous. But we have the promise from Jesus that it doesn't have to go that way in our lives. In fact, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus was talking to Peter and says, and your name is Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it, will not stand against it. When we are unified, nothing can stand against us. We have that old saying, even in our culture, united we stand, but divided we fall. And that's why unity is so important, because division is so destructive. And, and you ever watch the Discovery Channel and those animal shows? And what do the animals usually do for protection? They gather together in a group, whether it's the deer or the antelope or the fish. And what does the predator, predator always try to do? It tries to divide, to divide and conquer, to pull one of the weakest away from the group. That's how destructive division can be. When we're alone, when we're isolated, we are weakened so much. But when we are together as a group, we are strengthened. Division is dangerous. But we also have to remember that unity is not necessarily conformity. And I think that's why sometimes we try to avoid unity. We're all about being independent and being unique. I'm unique, just like everybody else. And yes, yes, you are. You are unique. God uniquely designed you and made you. He made you special. And there's not ever been another human being quite like you with your experiences, your skills, your talents. And so God's desire for you to live in unity is not to have you be like the cookie cutter person, just like everybody else. Unity is not conformity. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's talking about the church, the body of Christ, even as we read in, in Ephesians, how it's a body that builds one another up and works together in that unified way. But in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul points out that there's different parts to the body. The hand doesn't have the same experience or the same function as the eye. And the hand doesn't say to the body, well, since I'm not an eye, I guess I'm not going to be part of the body. A foot is not like the ear. They're different, uniquely different. You and I are uniquely different. We have different ways of communicating. We have different likes. We have different ways of seeing the world, of seeing God, of sharing and loving, of seeing things and how we experience and, and how we function. Unity is not conformity, but it's rather unity in diversity. It's when you have different people in different ways coming together and building one another up in love, sharing with one another different ideas and different perspectives. It's usually when a team works together and uses the skills of each member that that team gets more accomplished. Not when every single person has the same skill set. We need that diversity. But sometimes in our lives, what we do is we, we think that unity means conformity. That if you and I are going to work together, we got to see everything exactly the same. And if you don't see things the way I do, you need to get out of here. Or you need to get right and start acting more like me. How often do we do that? We see it a lot too in the generation gaps. And we don't realize that even Solomon wrote again in Ecclesiastes, God has made everything beautiful in its time. 
There's beauty in young people coming together with their energy and their zeal and their understanding of the world around them. And there's working together with people who are more experienced, who have some age and wisdom behind them, who have made some mistakes and can offer advice of life. And so often we want to separate and not experience that unity and diversity, that strength that we have from our differences and opinions and our different perspectives and our different experiences. Unity is not conformity. Unity is a beautiful thing. Unity with diversity. Unity in diversity. America, the United States, is known as the melting pot. It's where people from all different countries all over the world bring different pieces of their culture and we celebrate together the beauty and uniqueness of each one of us and together we enjoy that diversity. We enjoy the different colorfulness of life when we come together. But we also understand that we are better together. And so how do we make this work? How do we pursue unity in diversity? God's word doesn't just say, this is important, do it. But he explains to us over and over how, how to experience it. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says, let us consider, let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Consider how that we can encourage one another. Consider how we can build each other up and make one another better with our different perspectives, instead of using our differences to tear one another down, as is our human nature. And as we see all in the world around us, when one person tries to elevate themselves up, one person tries to pound their fist on the table, I'm right and you're wrong, instead of saying, I want to encourage you, I want to spur you on, I want to see you be all that you can be. We need to understand we're better together and we're better when we're loving. We're speaking the truth in love, even in correction, doing it for the building up, not the tearing down, not the controlling, not the conforming, but the transforming of making stronger. And James 1.9 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. I think that's worth saying one more time. Each one of us should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to come angry because we have it so backwards in our culture and our world today. We're quick to get angry, and we're quick to speak and defend our point of view, but we're so slow in listening. And I'm not just talking about listening, but really hearing, listening to other people's opinions to hear them and to understand them. Like we started off with, I'm not always 100% right, and neither are you. But you might get something a little bit right and different, and I might get something a little bit right, and if we listen to one another, we'll have a better understanding of the world around us, a better understanding of how to make life better for everyone. We need to be quick to listen. That should be our first instinct that when someone else wants to share from their experience something we've not experienced share from their thoughts that we haven't thought that we are quick to listen and listen to hear listen to understand so often we listen just long enough to say okay this is how i'm going to argue your point we listen to argue instead of listening to hear and listening to understand I've seen so many conversations where people argue back and forth, and if we actually, they actually just stopped and listened to one another, they'd realize they're actually 99% in agreement. It's just a little bit different on the details. But we never get to that point if we're not quick to listen and slow to speak. Don't we get into so much trouble when we speak before we think? We all have that foot and mouth disease, right? You say something and before you can even get the words out, you're like, I shouldn't have said that. And in order to maintain unity and harmony with one another, we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. We need to think 
before we open our mouths. We need to think through what we're saying. I've often said it, communication isn't what I say. It's what you hear. And so when I'm trying to convey an idea to you, I need to think about how you will hear and how you will take the words I say before I just shout you down. It's not even just about what I say. It's how will you receive it? What have your experiences in life and how have your experiences Change the way you absorb information, with the way you hear things, the way you receive. And I need to take that into account. We need to take into account other people's perspective when we're trying to communicate. And so we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Not everybody is out for a fight. Not everybody is trying to get us down. Sometimes people are just living their lives and we're so quick to become angry. And it destroys the unity that we could have, the unity and the harmony and the peace that we have in our lives. We, do, we need unity, unity in diversity, unity with the color and the variety. We need to be quick to speak or quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. This concept is so important to God. It's one of God's core values. God made us together to live in community, to build one another up in love and in harmony, to make each other's lives better, to fill the earth with God's glory, subdue it, and make it a beautiful place. And we can do that best when we're working together in unity. What areas in your life this week, whether it be in your family, in your marriage, at your workplace, in your community, your church, the organization that you work in, can you foster more unity? Unity with diversity, not with silencing different opinions, but with celebrating them. Where can you do that this week? I hope this message has encouraged you, challenged you, and inspired you this week. And I want to tell you, as always, as I do every week, that Jesus loves you, and so do I. But I also want to close with this thought. We could have the most unified and beautiful relationships in life. We could get along well with our family, with our friends, with our community, and still miss out on the greatest thing. God desires to have a oneness with you. Over and over in the Bible, Jesus is given a picture, gives himself a picture of being a groom and his church, the bride, of having a unified relationship. And he calls us to be one, to be one in the spirit with one another, but also to be one with him. Having what the Bible says, Christ in us and us living in Christ. Do you have that kind of relationship with God through Jesus Christ? There is only one way to receive that. It's through accepting what Jesus did on the cross for you. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes into a unified relationship with God except through me. Jesus loves you so much that he was willing to leave heaven's throne and come down and walk this earth and live a perfect life for you, knowing that you've made mistakes in order to offer you forgiveness. He died on the cross, taking the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins and our rebellion and our mistakes. And on the third day, he rose again. And all it takes to have this oneness and this relationship with God where He pours His Spirit into us, giving us a wholeness, is to just confess our need for Him, confess our sins, ask Him into our life, and tell Him that we believe not only in who He is, but what He has done for us. Would you like to ask Christ into your life today? Maybe this is your first time hearing this message. Maybe you've heard it a thousand times but something is pulling at your heart. It only takes a moment. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I've made a mess of my life in my relationships and in the way I've lived it hasn't been honoring to you, God, the God of all creation. 
and I'm sorry. I ask you to forgive me. And Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe you really did come down from heaven. You really did descend to the earthly region. And you died for my sins. I receive your forgiveness. And I do believe, Jesus, that you rose from the grave on the third day and ascended back into heaven and are preparing a place for me. I ask that you to come into my life, send your spirit into my heart, teach me and speak to me and guide me. Help me to learn and grow that I might live a life pleasing to you and that I might enjoy a relationship with you from now on through eternity. I ask this in your name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, the Bible says you have been born from above. You are now a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Let us know you made a decision. Text SAVED, S-A-V-E-D, to 973-755-1637. And we'd love to get in touch with you, to pray with you. Find a good church, a church that is unified, that will help you understand what it's like to live with Christ. Start off by praying, praying and talking to God often, reading and studying your Bible, and asking questions. And may God bless you and bless you abundantly. As always, thank you for watching. Until, I, until next time, bye.